جی السلام علیکم دس از ڈاکٹر انیل سلمان چیئر اکنامک سیکیورٹی ایٹ اسلام آباد پالیسی ریسرچ انسٹیٹیوٹ لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین نومبر ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی تھری دا سگنیفیکنس از دیٹ ناؤ وی ہیو اے And the last review was in 2013. Given 2013 and 2023, in these years, a lot of things happened. Let me tell you, we had offshore leaks, we had Swiss leaks, we had Panama Papers, and we had Paradise Papers. And FinCEN in US, they said that Indian businessmen, they might be the steel entrepreneurs or they may be the diamond traders, and they are involved in in such kind of uh, financial crimes. Today, I would like to have an interview with Dr. Usman Jahan, who is advisor on economics and national development at Center for Aerospace and Security. Let me tell you that if you Google Dr. Usman, you will find a lot of papers, but his niche, why we have invited him at EPRI Studio is FATF. And Dr. Saab has written quite a lot on FATF. And today we are going to talk about that FATF, now it's India's turn. Ji, Islam alaikum, Dr. Saab. Wa alaikum, Salaam. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Happy to be here. You see that uh, Pakistan came out of FATF gray list. And now it's India's turn. But before we delve into that what has been the terrorist financing and money laundering issues, I would like to ask you that what are your specific concerns, criticisms regarding FATF's weaponization? Thank you for this question. To be honest with you, there are at least five things that I am very concerned about in the structure and the implementation and praxis of the FATF. The first issue regards the legitimacy of this body to begin with. The FATF is not a UN treaty body. It is not one of those things that was signed after World War II, not one of those things that all countries have ratified. Instead, it is pretty much an ad hoc body. And not every country is a signatory of it, but they render decisions on countries that are non-members. And so everybody is hooked and pulled in to this evaluation system, even when the judgments may not be comprehensive, they not, might not be well thought out, and they might be extremely adverse for countries. So the legitimacy is the first question that I have regarding the FATF as a self-anointed king. Um, the second is on the weaponization and the arbitrariness with which they exert uh, immense pressure on countries. There is a very significant political element to the FATF and how they d discern and differentiate among countries, picking on some uh, extremely harshly and letting others go a little bit too easily. So this weaponization is a very big concern in the political structure that underpins the FATF. The third issue is about the mission creep. I will draw you back to the inception of FATF in 1989. It was meant to combat the war on drugs, the narco-trafficking element. But the fact is that after narco-trafficking flew a little bit out of people's radars, you had 9-11 and they became uh, the warriors for the global war on terror. After that, they jumped into non-proliferation stuff And now they have jumped into virtual currencies. So they just keep expanding their mandate left, right, and center. And the problem is that my fourth point is exactly that, that it is not an effective body. Because how can you persuade me that black money is lower today than when they started out? Mm. How can you tell me that non-proliferation is less of a risk now than back then? Or that uh, money laundering is less now than it is back then? Actually, these problems have gotten significantly worse. So if you had to evaluate the FATF, it has done terribly on these things. And a big part of that, which is my fifth point, is that it is a misdirect institution insofar as it looks at money laundering. Because if you really cared about money laundering, you would not be targeting developing sovereign countries. That's not where the problem is. The problem is where this money ends up, which is specific jurisdictions in the developed world, states or these island nations, and they rack up now trillions of dollars just sitting there. It's not like they actually use it. If you really had to target, you would target them and you would target the channels through this. And I'll give you one example. Deutsche Bank, a prestigious German bank, right. was 
uh, implicated in siphoning on behalf of oligarchs in the former Soviet Union between 2010 and 2014, anywhere between 20 and 80 billion dollars. And it went where? Into Europe, into the fancy banks with the nice suits. And so if you really care about money laundering, you would bring down Deutsche Bank because that is the problem. So what I argue there to you is that the enemy doesn't come on a boat. He comes in a limousine. <laughs> you very rightly talked about uh, this uh, fat of weaponization. But let's talk about how they are treating the countries. When we look at Pakistan and now when we are looking at India, we see that the procedures might be the same, but the treatment is different. Why is it so? It's an excellent question. It's a sensitive question because ultimately it boils down to the political nature of this body. And it doesn't actually follow a logically coherent approach to the treatment of countries. And I'll show you why. If you look at this region and you looked at the relative proportion of the black economy or whether you looked at the absolute size of the black economy, Pakistan would not be your target number one. Because, for example, if you cared about the relative size of the black economy, you would target Afghanistan because 100% of their economy is a black economy. Right. So just bring them down. If you cared about the absolute size of the black economy, then you would go after India because uh, CBI, so the Central Bureau of Investigation, uh, major uh, authority in India, their officials have estimated in, in on documents that it is about $500 billion worth of black money is there in their economy, which makes sense if if you look at the size of a trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar economy, so it's not a ridiculous number. But that is an undocumented one. Yes, but it, uh, the black economy, including everything. In okay. It. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you have a five hundred billion dollar black economy, that means that your black economy is larger than the entire economy of Malaysia, of Denmark of the UAE. So whether you look at it in a relative sense or an absolute sense, it doesn't make sense and there is not a logical uh, consistency among who they target, how and when. So we know that directly we cannot catch money laundering. It's not that some money launderer would come to the government and he would register something that, okay, bravo, this year we have done that. So with reference to FATF, there are certain guidelines. And if those guidelines are present in that country and the countries are complying to it, then we say that, okay, we are pulling you out of the gray list. Now, my question to you is that when we look at India's legal infrastructure pertaining to anti-money laundering and uh, the terrorist uh, financing, does it conform to the global benchmarks and mandates uh, established by the entities like FATF? To be honest with you, it partially complies with the guidelines, but there are many shortcomings in what they have so far. The problem is that, as you correctly mentioned, a lot has changed since 2013. The fundamentals that they have put in in the legal basis are a 2002 Anti-Money Laundering Act and a 1988 Benami Law Act. And they proceed from that, and they have various institutions that work on this. For example, the Central Bureau of Investigation, CBI, the National Investigation Agency, and others work together. And we have to remember that money laundering or financial oversight as a whole is a work in progress. It is never complete. It is an ongoing effort. And given the size of their population, the size of the informal economy, the level of development, there will always be issues that they have. But the problem is that there are a, there is an increasing body of evidence provided by various stakeholders in India that there are serious shortcomings in the compliance of India with the guidelines of the FATF. And many different clauses among that uh, rubric that you mentioned uh, are deficient. So actually, India may be uh, brought back to look at original points that it may have appeared to comply on before, but doesn't comply on anymore. But is it the problem that the local institutions they are not complying or it's that the international institution FATF itself has turned its back? Uh, I would say that the the onus here is above all on the local institutions 
because this rubric is not specific to any one country. So you can always look at the relative performance, whatever the made up rubric is, and see that there's shortcomings in India. That speaks to how institutions are evolving there, how society is evolving, the population is growing, the culture is changing. So the FATF alone cannot account for the shortcomings in India, but we can always go back to what is listed in the FATF thing and look at whether things really make sense in a universal context, because one size fits all approach approaches to any complex issue that is international and transboundary in nature doesn't make sense anyways. But again, coming back to my, my previous question, when you have so much, and you also talk, uh, talked about it, that we have so much evidence about it, but why the world is not doing anything? Why these uh, organizations like FATF, they are not pointing fingers that the US has the evidence. Uh, we see that the economy is growing business as usual. No such uh, penalties have been placed on India. Why? I think that this speaks entirely to the political nature of the FATF, the way that they have an inconsistent treatment among countries, and the ultimate agenda of tackling money laundering to begin with. Again, if you really cared about money laundering, you wouldn't be targeting developing countries at all because they're not the most criminal uh, component within the system. So the politicization, I think, is the key reason why this comparatively lax treatment is meted on some countries as opposed to others. Okay. My fourth question to you, that there has been a swift uh, expansion of financial technology in India particularly when we are contrasting it with the perceived state of regulatory preparedness, may prompt uh, concerns. Now, what is your perspective on India's strategies for overseeing and regulating virtual currencies and other emerging financial technologies within the framework of terrorist financing and money laundering? You know, there are two parts to this question. The first is what the FATF wants, and the second is what India does. On the first part, it's important to remember that FATF has jumped from area to area of interest, and the most recent area is virtual currencies. In virtual currencies, which includes crypto and other uh, cognate uh, instruments of that sort, the FATF had issued guidelines. These guidelines are extremely restrictive. They basically embed decentralized distributed ledger technologies into the existing banking system, which ultimately thwarts the original logic of having cryptocurrencies to begin with. The whole point was to be outside the system, but the FATF's guidelines try to force it back in. I'll give you an example of that. There is something called the travel rule that the FATF had once put out. The travel rule says that if I own crypto here, then I have to register it within the banking system by linking it to my bank account here. But if I move to another country, then I would have to do the same when I move there and link it to an account there. When you have this kind of a forcing of integration, then it basically denies and nullifies the original objective of these currencies. So it's extremely restrictive, extremely rudimentary, and very harsh to the point that people in countries that want to use this will end up not using it if this is really what is fully done. India had no rules for a long time, from 2008 to, let's say, 2017. There were no specific uh, attitudes or guidelines in force, but then... Regarding the cryptocurrency. Regarding cryptocurrency. And they were not even legalized. They were not legalized okay. either. And so quiet on that front. But then a sweeping ban came across the country with respect to crypto that it was illegal and it shouldn't be touched and nothing should be done. So you went from having nothing said about it to then saying absolutely not. Now you're starting to see a discussion and some preliminary steps towards legislation that might accommodate it somewhere in that. But FATF guidelines, if they are used, they would be so restrictive that it would be practically like not having any guidelines at all or having a ban entirely because you need to understand the balance between regulation and innovation. People are interested in cryptocurrencies as a means to innovate and have wealth creation and try out new things that are outside the old system. At the same time, regulation means that you have to put things in the correct pace so that you can seek redress for aggrieved parties, you can have financial stability, and this is not an easy balance to strike for any country. And the FATF is merely 
prescriptive. It just wants to get in on this uh, debate, but it really has very little, I believe, to contribute relative to the most robust systems put in by the best countries. But do we have any proven examples by uh, where FATF has actually worked on the virtual currencies and the kind of transparency it brings, it wants to bring in? It has actually given the results? No, because no country seems to have adopted entirely the prescriptive guidelines. So it's hard to measure if there's a natural experiment between two similar economies, one did and one didn't, and we could see the results. We don't have that sort of thing. But there are countries that take regulation seriously. The best example is the United States, which has the SEC, CFTC, and all these institutions doing their part. And yet they also face difficulties in this. So it isn't an easy, clear-cut case either way. One question still, uh, like, narrating what you are saying. We have these virtual currencies because we say that they are uh, completely decentralized. You don't have that kind of uh, intervention from the central bank. But it is highly documented. But what happens, uh, like, even in India, when the transactions are happening in the dark web, it's completely undocumented. And how fat of, or is there any other mechanism where we can track such kind of transactions? Uh, to be honest with you, there is a mechanism built in within the blockchain which makes it ultimately traceable. They always say, or they used to say that it's a totally anonymous way of doing exchange, but this isn't true. You can, with enough computer power, enough investigators put on the case, track who owns what, where, and why. And a good example of this was the attack on the Continental P uh, Pipeline in the United States, the Eastern Board. And the ransom we required for it was a certain number of Bitcoin. And the FBI, the Department of Justice, did it. They tracked who did it, and they managed to retrieve a significant portion um, almost all of it, but the value had fallen since they retrieved it. So it is possible to track things. It's just that you need a lot of manpower. So if there is rampant abuse, we simply won't have the resources to track everything. But if you have uh, intermittent cases of violations, then you can dedicate the resources to investigate. So the traceability is inherent in the blockchain too. My next question is regarding the nonprofit organizations. From your perspective, uh, what are your insights into the strategies and measures that India has adopted to safeguard the non-profit organizations from the potential manipulation by the terrorist entities? The non-profit organization, the non-profit sector in India has suffered greatly in recent years. Uh, because of the FATF being used as cover by the government to restrict the availability of finance for good causes. In any society, civil society element has a very significant role to play in creating public value, along with the private sector, politicians, and the government, the bureaucracy. But in India in recent years, you are seeing uh, the usage of FATF-oriented laws misused to clamp down on NPOs that may otherwise be doing very good stuff. Right. Now, the evidence of that comes from a 46-page report that was submitted by a consortium, you can say, of NPOs, which had interviewed 700 members of the uh, nonprofit organizations, communities, etc., to gather this and to articulate to the FATF that it is a very serious problem. In 2010, there was only 40 NPOs that were refused a license to operate. In 2023, that number is more than 20,000 NPOs that have been rejected. Now, the way the government does it there is that it makes a flag, it makes a note that this NPO is suspect for a frivolous reason, they just make it up, and then the bank cannot disperse the funds to the NPO because it has been flagged. Right. Modi G, the um, Pradhan Mantri, the Prime Minister of India, has seen many civil society elements and NPO, non-profit organizations, as instruments in trying to dethrone him. So he's very hostile to this. And so when we look at the entire architecture of public uh, value creation in any society, if you're clamping down on civil society and using financial instruments to do this, it's very bad for a society. But the interesting thing is the FATF rule. It's the clause number eight in the guidelines or the area number eight where they look at uh, that they're using the FATF rules as cover for this. So it's being misappropriated for 
cutting down on civil society activity. So it doesn't make India a biggest democracy, rather it becomes a divided democracy. There's many reasons why you would say it isn't a well-working democracy now, tragically. But uh, the non-profits have been doing a good work in India. But with this uh, reduction or not giving, not clearing, giving the clearance to the funds to these uh, non-profits, I think the development work has also been affected of a great deal in a India. Absolutely. So one good example is what happened in COVID-19. The activity of not allowing these NPOs to get the requisite funding to then procure the material to, for example, do relief work on affected communities. Mm, exacerbated the death toll. And we know that India was a particular case where there was a massive death toll. It was 500,000 deaths or something. It's the second or third highest in the world. And the NPOs could have played a very important role in that, as it did in other developing countries where the state cannot always extend its fullest support or make the biggest difference alone. And so if you use the clamping down of funds and cut, curtail the activity of NPOs, then when disaster strikes, or even in peacetime conditions, the public value destruction will be quite significant. So, uh, how I infer that Moody is then using FATF as a scapegoat or as a reason for being threatened by these uh, non-profits? Absolutely. It provides him the cover because there are laws for, for example, foreign contribution regulation so that you make sure that there isn't the uh, usage of foreign funds to fund elections in right. India. But the truth is, ironically, that the finance bill in 2018 removed the transparency on foreign funding anyways. So instead, the rules that exist because of this are being used for clamping down on civil society, whereas you're not getting more transparency on foreign funding because of other rules. Dr. Chuhan, an excellent discussion. And using FATF, you have unveiled a number of misconceptions that were about India. My last question to you, that is there any evidence that suggests that the BJP acts as a money laundering conduit in alignment with the objectives of the RSS? There's certainly a lot of uh, evidence to suggest that. The leadership of the BJP is RSS in its orientation today. And BJP political workers in many parts of the country, such as in Orisha, have been caught in money laundering charges. So it is a very serious issue there. And then there's the issue of sympathetic business people, strong business people with the deep ideological ties that then act in favor of it, of the BJP, uh, through the money laundering conduit mechanisms. So business people, political workers who are BJP, who are sympathetic to the RSS, do engage in money laundering. But there's one other factor I would bring up, that it isn't just a BJP-specific thing. Mm -hmm. The Congress party has also had massive corruption scandals over the last 20 years. So and every political party has been engaged. Precisely. And I would argue to you that the reason that Congress has not been as popular over the last decade is because they had marred their reputation with so much corrup corruption in massive scandals, such as the telecom license right. scandal. So it is across the board and it is a symptom of politics in a country so large and underdeveloped that money laundering is engaged by both Congress and BJP, the major parties. It's just that the BJP tends to have a more ideological bent, the means to the end sort of thing that uh, the means justify a more ideological end that matters. But otherwise, you see it across the spectrum there. A further point I would like to add on this uh, terrorism and BJP issue is that, that there is a domestic element to money laundering in India, but the tentacles of the RSS and the BJP extend to wider South Asia and then beyond that to the larger overseas. And you see the evidence of that with the Kulbushan Yadav case, for example. So who the hell was funding all of that? It has been admitted to. Transboundary terrorism? Transboundary terrorism. And that is state-sponsored in that sense, right. because the BJP is now the state for all intents and purposes. And then you also see that in the acrimony that has been created between India and Canada through the assassination of a Sikh separatist hero True. or leader. And so the money laundering conduits by which such assassinations and other terrorist activities are done 
also is a very significant part of it beyond just the domestic problems of money laundering conducted by BJP sympathizers in India. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan, for such wonderful and excellent insights. It really opens up, and I hope when FATF reviews India, it do take about these measures, the evidence that is available, and it is done in a right spirit. Thank you very much for tuning in to this podcast.